Everybody's up and running. All the things are running. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to our uh, presentation about Scott McKenzie's. How many yards? Long height. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the snacks over there, and this is Scott McKenzie. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. 2021, I two-hiked a uh, fun little bike trail. It went from Mexican border all the way up to the Canadian border. It was originally set to be 2,935 miles is what the official miles was, but with the fire reroute that we had to take in New Mexico and then again up to at the end of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, I estimate we probably did around 2,500 miles total. So we lost several hundred miles off this fire reroute, having to do walking on roads and everything else. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the gear that I took. I'll show you the, my gear. I'll talk about trail conditions like animals, uh, the weather, the people, the fellow hikers that I hiked with, the food that we ate. And then we'll get into some questions and answers. And then I have a slideshow. There's 498 pictures, I think. And you'll get to see everything from the snow to the deserts to everything in between. So here is the actual trail. You start at Mexico border, goes through New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, goes into Idaho, comes back into Montana, goes up to the Canadian border. The one thing about the Continental Divide Trail, it's it's unfinished. It's not all complete. Sometimes they have me on roads, other times you're going through the forest, and there's actually not a defined trail you walk on. No two hikers will hike the exact same trail the whole way up unless you are one behind the other the whole way. Other than that, you just kind of pick your route and you just go map, compass. You have uh, different apps I call it, it's called gun hooks that I use where I can get on my phone and kind of see where I am in relation to the trail. Like I said, I can sit there, I can sit there and see that there is no trail. And, but my gut hooks might tell me I'm right on it. But you have no clue. So every about 15, 20 minutes, I'm constantly checking my gut hooks and I was having my map and compass and I was checking to see where I was as I went up through. So in the beginning, we started at the desert border and like I said, we worked our way through, but I'll get into the gear that I took. This is my backpack, weighs just less than two pounds, hyper light mountain gear. It's supposed to be waterproof because it's made of Dyneema, it's a Cuban fiber. And on the inside though, I always carry a compactor trash bag that I put everything in. I put that in first and then put all my stuff in. In case I would fall in the river, or something and I didn't want any water to get in there to get my sleeping bag and my change of clothes wet because that could be pretty bad. Actually I would hike in one set of clothes. This was the set that I always hiked in my pants and a shirt. Hiked in that every day and then when I would get to my camp at night 
I would change out and get into my dry set, which is usually like a very thin wool. I have a pop to it. It's a very lightweight. Also had wind pants and wind shirt. Each of them weighed about two or three ounces. And it's broke the wind because the winds were the winds were brutal out there. There were sometimes we were 40, 50 plus 60 mile an hour winds on different days. I always carried rain gear, top and bottom. Again, very lightweight. They kept the rain off and wear that quite a bit. But like I said, you know, I always carry a pair of wool insulated bottoms and wool top. That's what I would sleep in at night. I never wore these things when I was hiking because if I got them wet and hypothermia could set in whenever I would get to. So every morning, it didn't matter if it rained on me all day long the day prior, and these things were soaking wet, I had to put them back on the next morning. And when you put them on and it's 35 or 40 degrees, you sit there and shiver for a little while until you can get your body heat going. And then this is my little puffy that I wear all the time. Just like I said, it's just down. It's got me through all three of my three lights. It weighs about six, six and a half ounces, I think. Fantastic. And sometimes I would have to sleep in this inside my sleeping bag. It got that cold. I always wore darn tough socks. They're just a uh, renal wool, perfect. They usually get me about four or 500 miles, which is about the same as my shoes. These are ultra long peaks. This is about a trail running shoe. That's all I wear the whole way through. Always had gloves, same thing. Wool, wool gloves and a fleece and a cap I would wear. And a lot of times I kept the fleece hot when I was sleeping, but I would rarely ever wear it when I hiked unless it was raining and I had my rain jacket on and the hood up over so it wouldn't get wet. I had to make sure that stuff stayed nice and dry. Now in the desert, I took this uh, ultra light umbrella, not so much for the rain, but for the sun. But the only thing was, I think I only used it one time. Because the sun didn't bother me after serving in Iraq and being the temperature that was 130 plus degrees in the summer, when I'm in the desert there in New Mexico and it's 90, 95 degrees, you know, and we, we would find shade, uh, shade tree and we'd get underneath the shade tree for a break. And usually wherever the shade tree was, it was usually from cows, because the cows wanted to be under there too, so there was a lot of cow patties that you had to try to move out of the way just so you could lay down a little bit and rest during the, the hot part of the day. For my sleeping, this is my Thermarest NeoAir. This was the Xtherm. This was this kept me warm underneath me. Probably every morning I woke up in my tent, especially towards the end, and I had frost on the inside of my tent. And from my condensation, it just froze. It got that cold. But my Thermarest kept me warm underneath. And then I also had a quilt, and my quilt's in here. And the reason I use a quilt instead of a sleeping bag is whenever you're on a sleeping bag and your body compresses that insulation down, that insulation no longer keeps you warm because that insulation has to have air, air pockets. So the quilt is like cut in the back, so it's almost like a blanket wraps around you. That's why I like my external because it's the R value is like seven something and it's radiating my heat back to me so I'm staying warm through the night. I always kept, oh yeah, wash rag anytime I got a chance where I can get to water and I could sit there and do a quick little burn by, clean up before I got into my sleeping bag because I don't want all the dirt, the sand, the oils getting onto my sleeping bag because then that reduces its insulating value. So I was always trying to keep clean out there. For my tent, I, I always switch through tents during a through hike. This is my Hyperlite Mountain Gear. This is my Drigo 2. It weighs just under two pounds. And it's, again, like I said, it's completely waterproof. Does a great job in the storms, but I didn't like it. Because almost every, every tent that I've had, I'm a tall guy, I'm six foot three. When I'm laying flat out in this tent or the other tents that I have, my head hits the side, and my feet hit the end. 
So when that, and then all that condensation gets on there, and then my, the bottom of my sleeping bag gets wet, the top of my head, whatever hat I'm wearing, or the, the quilt gets wet. So I'm still on the search. Um, there's another tent I'm looking at, Z-Pax, that's actually a seven foot long on the inside. So I'm looking at doing that for my next through hike. I did go through another tent when I was out there. This is lightweight from Six Moon. And actually this comes, this is actually a cape. This is a poncho that goes as my outer shell over my bunk neck. Now this was fantastic, but it was so thin where everything touched me on the sides and on the ends. And the condensation really built up in that. So very extremely lightweight, but I couldn't move. I felt more claustrophobic in there being a big guy. So I didn't, I, I didn't care for that. Of course, when the mosquito season's out, you always have to have your little bug net. Keep the mosquitoes away. And never had to wire this when I hiked, because I was wearing bug spray. But once we got to our camp, mosquitoes got so bad sometimes that once we set our tents up, we would have to jump in our tent and actually eat our food in the tent. We'd put our stove outside in the vestibule, heat our stuff up, when it was ready, get it inside the tent, and we'd eat because they would just, hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes just swarm me in attacking you. It's just really horrible at different times. Underneath my tent, I always put, even though it's Cuban fiber and it says that it will not puncture, I always carry another little Cuban fiber ground sheet to go under me. And I also use this when I would stop on breaks. And I laid this down on the desert floor or on the snow, and this would keep me safe from whatever the, the ground was. So if there was any like thorns or anything that could stick me or mud, whatever, I would put this underneath my tent and then I use this during the day. This is my little seat. I would put this down on the ground wherever I sat and I would just sit on it or I'd lean it up against a tree or something I would have. And that was my comfort. Okay, talking about, oh, and then back in early Colorado, we got into a lot of snow. A lot of snow. Some of it was up to, close to up to my waist. When we were getting right for, right before Creed, Colorado, the snow, the guys were coming back down, they were like, caveman. My trail name was Caveman because I hiked barefoot on the AP and back in 2016-17 I did a lot of barefoot hiking 10 miles a day. So I was being called caveman. So, yeah, but they called caveman, you gotta turn around. I'm like, why? They said, we're up to our chest in snow trying to swim through it. It's just too hard. So we're coming back down. We went back down in the creek and was formulating another plan. So when I was hiking on the snow and on the ice, I wore my micro spikes on my feet so I could get good grip on the ice because Sometimes you're on the side of a mountain that's pretty steep, and you have a thousand foot drop. And if you were to slip on that ice, you're gonna slide. So I always kept these on my feet when I got scared. And my ice axe, I had that out a few times, never had to use it for self-arrest. Self-arrest is if you slide and you start going down to your death, you have it, and it's a technique to go and hit and just slow your, you know, your, your fall and then try to recover and get back up. I had it out several times. Thank goodness I never had to use it. Now it is good to use for a tackle. You gotta go poop. <laughs> so, because my other, my, my trowel that I use is lightweight titanium. You're, I mean, you're constantly hitting rocks. And they say that you're supposed to dig down six, eight inches, depending where you're at. And you're hitting, even in the desert, you're hitting rocks. And it was like bending this thing. But you do what you can, do your business, cover it up, and continue onward. Uh, water. I always carry like smart water book bottles to drink out of. And what I would do when I got to the different things, I would get my water in different you squeeze filtration systems like this. I put water in this and then the squeeze and you screw this on and you screw that water through into your drinking containers and then you can sit there that water is purified and this thing is good for 100,000 gallons 
about the three ounces, fantastic. When it gets, starts getting clogged up with the sediment and all that, it comes with a syringe. And then you sit there and you screw this thing off and you can back flush it with the syringe. Or the one thing we did learn out there, if you have the smart water bottle with the cap, with this, this, so it goes right down over it, and then you can back flush that with more force by squeezing it as you can with the syringe. So we really started enjoying that. The thing that my family just loved, Donut got it. Donut I had started on a through hike east of California. We through hike in 2018 on the Appalachian Trail. And we, we split a Garmin in reach. And we had preset messages that would go to his family and my family. And we'd be messaged at the end of the day where they would get a message. I'm out of cell coverage. We stopped for the night. I'm safe. And that gave our families peace of mind. So they, then they could relax and go to bed not knowing, knowing that I wasn't out there dead somewhere. <laughs> so this was definitely a good thing to have. This was my first aid kit. I didn't take much at all. Had some gear repair tape. I had KT tape to put on anything if I were to get blisters, but I never had blisters. And just a little bit of like biofreeze and some kind of like antibiotics for if I got stuck with something. So my first aid kit was very, very small. Getting into my food. I carried my food in a Cuban fiber bag. And then I could hang this up into the trees when we did have trees. When you're in the desert, you don't have trees, so you kind of just sleep with your food. When we were in grizzly country, I had an ursac. And I just tie this off a big, uh, big branch or right around the trunk of a tree, like 50 yards or something from my tent. And it has Kevlar. And a grizzly bear cannot go through this. Now on the Pacific Crest Trail, I have to carry a bear box, a ball bear ball and that's required on the Pacific Crest Trail in like five different areas but this is 8.8 .8 ounces where my bear ball is two pounds and nine ounces so it'll be I'll be carrying a lot more weight when I'm on the Pacific Crest Trail now some of the food that I ate out there sometimes I would get the dehydrated freeze-dried meals like my own house or I went into peak higher protein which I needed on the second half of my hike because when I got halfway and I got off the trail to come home for problems with my feet and shoes I had lost so much weight and so much strength when I was in my hotel room ready to come home in July I dropped and did 10 good push-ups and I was about done I mean 10 push-ups and I'm so used to I can do 300 burpees and that's 300 push-ups in with a slot for us and jump and everything and I could barely do 10 push-ups. I got that weak because I didn't have enough protein so I was I went into the higher protein stuff. And then of course some of the traditional things, other things you get, you get some mashed potatoes, the north side dishes, rice and pastas, like packs of tuna, packs of spam, just add that into with whatever I had. Of course, the mighty ramen noodles. When I did my, what's that? It saved many people. It saved many people. And after my first through hike in 2015 on the AT, I never ate this again until halfway through my 2018 through hike. <laughs> but then I ate them a little bit more. And of course, the old trusty jar of peanut butter. That was out of all three of my through hikes, I always had a jar of peanut butter, high calorie. So it was, and I don't know why, I just never got tired of eating peanut butter. So, and how I would cook, I would call, it's called freezer bag cooking. And what I would do was get something like this, and I would do this in the towns, where I would empty this into a freezer bag. And I would write on the freezer bag what it was and how many ounces of water or how many cups of water I had to add. And then, I would sit there and heat up on my stove. I would get the fuel canister. This is my MSR pocket rocket. I would just screw that on top, start it, put my cup on top, boil the water, 
pour my water into the freezer bag with the food in it and then put that in the, my little koozie and I would let it sit there and cook for 10, 10 minutes, whatever, and it would finish cooking. And that way I had no, I never had to clean out my cup because the only thing was ever in this water was boiled water. I never had to cook in there where I'm cleaning it every night by a stream and having to worry about rodents or anything coming in because then it was sealed inside my empty Ziploc bag. I had whatever the, I mean, you try to get as much as you can out of it. You're scraping about everything you can, but long spoon. I always make sure I had my long spoon so I can get the whole way to the bottom. <laughs> Just eat it, a little small spoon. You're getting your fingers, skin on your fingers and kind of nasty, so. Now, that was my pocket rocket. This has got me through all three of my through hikes, but I did change in the beginning and I got this little, little one this is one ounce. It's almost the same thing. Just little arms that come up. It's almost like, and this is three ounces, but with this, with the sharp edges, this is the case it comes in. That case is an ounce. That's four ounces as opposed to one ounce. Now, but I changed back to this when I got to Grizzly Country, when I got cold, because I'm like, I don't want one of these things to break on me, and then I have no way to cook my meal. So I went back to my pocket rocket to finish my meal out there. So that's basically my entire food supply. But like I said, I would try to find out what I needed. I try to have 4,000 calories, well, two pounds of food per day, depending on how many days I was out there. I could be out there five days, up to eight days. And I would try to keep my calories at 125 calories per ounce. And if I did that, that would give me 4,000 calories for my, my two pounds of food, as opposed to if I were to get like 100 calories per ounce, like pasta and stuff like that, that only gives me 3,200 calories for that same two pounds of food in my pack. So it gives me an extra 800 calories per day that added up to try to keep my weight on. And all, all my through hikes, I've lost 27 plus pounds. I always start at 217 and I always go down to 190, but on this last one, for whatever reason, I wasn't getting enough protein and I fell below 190. And like I said, I got so weak where I couldn't do push ups and I increased my protein intake. So that's what I would do for my meals. Now, when you start off in the desert, I was scared to death to start off in the desert because the last time I was in the desert was Iraq. And I didn't know how I was going to handle Iraq because I have post traumatic stress disorder. I'm 100% disabled through the military for it. And being out there with Donut and a couple of the other guys that started with APAC and Happy. And one thing with Happy, that's his trail name, Happy Go Lucky. Once he finished his hike, he took uh, two weeks off and he went down and did the Arizona Trail and became the fast, did the fastest known time. He broke the record for the fastest known time. So he, he attempted it three times prior to that. So I was always around hikers who were, did very well. So it was always, be nice around people like that. But New Mexico, we dealt with a lot of, not a lot, but rattlesnakes. I saw like three rattlesnakes the whole trip. For some reason in the desert, I thought I would see a rattlesnake behind every sagebrush. I just thought I would. And the other thing I never said I would do in the desert, and I did it <laughs> numerous times, was cowboy camp, where I didn't put my tent up. I would get to, we'd get to the site, and I would just throw my stuff right on the sand and sleep out under the stars and I think I'd wake up in the morning with a rattlesnake, tarantulas, <laughs> or scorpions curled up inside with me the like, next morning, nothing. <laughs> and everyone said the same thing that everyone said, oh, I'm never cowboy camping, never cowboy camping in the desert with this. And almost every one of us did. <laughs> so, and we were all safe, so. But like I said, some of the water supplies you'll see in the pictures were so nasty that when I ran through my filter, where I would do two liters through this one spot, my filter would clog so bad, I had to back flush it with one of my one liters of clean water to get it to work again. That's how bad some of the water sources were out there. And thank goodness for the water, uh, the filters, or we all would have had Giardia and just everything else under the sun. I, it was, sometimes you couldn't see down to the bottom of the cattle trough that they had there. And that's what the cattle were drinking out of. And then there's ponds and oh, it's just 
the water's nasty. And then up into Colorado, once we were getting ready to hit the border, we hit snow. Like I said, I talked about it. It was up to our waist. Some three places ahead was up to our chest. The entire way through Colorado, not one day that I did not either hike through snow and ice or had a pail on me, snow on me, or rain on me. And when I got into hiking with Storm Dasher, and we halfway up to Colorado, we hiked the rest of the way up and, and did some Wyoming, that we sometimes we were cursing the weather. We were just like, boy, you just one night, please stop raining on us. And it was just like every night. So every night it would rain and we'd have to put away a wet tent. And Wyoming got nice. We had a great basin. That was another desert. That was, wasn't as nice in the Great Basin. You didn't have as many colorful lizards and snakes and plants. It was more barren. So I didn't care for the, the Great Basin, but then Montana, you know, the rest of the half or half of Wyoming and Montana. Whew, the most beautiful sites, the Wind River Range, the Glacier National Park, the most beautiful sites. You'll get to see some of the pictures here. Uh, the people you meet on the trail, trail angels and trail magic. If you may come to a road and someone may give you a ride, that's a trail angel, give you a ride. Because some of the towns were 30 miles away from where the trail came out to the road. And if someone didn't give you a ride, you spent all day walking to that town, getting your resupplies, and an entire day walking back. That's just taken away from all your supplies and that's just extra miles added on. So when someone would help give you a ride, you, we call them trail angels. And sometimes you would get to, it, this happened a lot on the AP, it's called trail magic, where you come out to a road, people would have cores set up, you know, and they cook food for you. Those are, that's trail magic. They're giving you food and drinks. On the CDT, only a couple times, only a couple times. And the one that really stuck out to me was, we were pulled over, we were walking on the side of the road, and this caravan pulls over. The guy comes out, he's, carrying a pack of cookies and a bottle of Gatorade for me. Trail magic. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. And he stops and he's like, Cookie Monster. <laughs> and that was my trail name at 15. I said, yeah. I'm looking, I'm like, you look familiar. And he's like, the family. I'm the family. Me and his wife and his their four daughters do hike in 15 and I knew them. And here they are out on the Continental Divide Trail and we meet on the trail. <laughs> so that was just so neat to be able to see them. And then another person, uh, like I said, I needed a ride. I met a girl, TJ and her dog Griff, and TJ's brother, they met me in Colorado, and I was doing a road walk. We talked for a while. She gave me her number when I got to Salida. And she said, if you need anything, give me a call. I can give you a ride or bring stuff to you. So I, was, I gave her a call when I was in Salida because I had to get up to Monarch Pass to the lodge. I had a new sneaker that was sent to me. And it was like almost 20 miles away. It was just straight up. So I called her and she came down to Salida, picked me up, took me up there, got my package, drove me back down to Salida. Trail angel. So it's nice to be able to meet people like that. It really restores your faith in humanity when you meet people like that on the trail. Uh, animal, other animals, grizzly bears. I saw, well, 10 grizzly bears total. The first three, the first three I didn't actually see. The mother of two cubs. But Storm Dasher, who was hiking with me, he's faster, so he's ahead of me. And he comes running back, waving his arms, go back, go back, go back. And he says, there's a grizzly with two cubs right up there. Where's your bear spray? I'm like, in my pack. <laughs> <laughs> so I just we run back a little bit, drop our pack, get our bear spray out. And you can hear the, the grizzly with the two cubs running up the next hill. And we're making, by then, a lot of noise. And we are just coming out of the Great Basin, out of the desert. So we just finished the desert, and there's three grizzlies. And then there was one night I was hike, I was I hiked alone and I camped. And it was just getting dusk, and I heard these branches break because I was in this real thick thing of pines. And I'm like, oh, there's an elk coming. Okay. And then I hear the branches breaking because I'm thinking the big antlers are just breaking the branches and it's coming through. And all of a sudden it stops. And I'm like, okay, he knows I'm here. And all of a sudden I started hearing this guttural growl. And I looked out the tent, and it was just getting dusty, and I could see the shape, and it was a grizzly bear. And then the cub ran up the tree, and I'm like, oh my, I'm going to die. Because <laughs> now it's 40 yards away, and I'm thinking, now it's going to protect the cub. It's going to come take out the threat so the cub can come back down the tree. But I'm out there with my headlamp in one hand, 
and my bear spraying the other, I'm like, if it gets within 30 yards, I have to spray. But thank goodness, like two minutes later, I don't know how, act of God, thank you, the cub came back down the tree and they ran back the way they came. And then we saw five more up in Glacier National Park with Storm Dasher, myself, and Dog on. We came, one was with a grizzly with a cub, and I filmed that one. Shook a little bit, but I filmed it. They were no more 20 yards away foraging for berries. And we just walked by, I'm like, wow, there's, there's a grizzly bear and a cub. This is so cool. And then we saw three more later that day down by Grizzly Lake. And then other than that, I, that was the 10 grizzlies that I saw. And that's 10 more than I wanted to see. <laughs> I wanted to see them in Yellowstone National Park, like a 500 yards away when I'm with a thousand other tourists. When I walked through there, but didn't see any. So, of course, I didn't even see a buffalo when I was in Yellowstone. And there was a herd out there of like a thousand. I didn't see one. I didn't see one. So I was disappointed. But uh, yeah, it's the animals, the people, the trail, trail conditions. Uh, just any questions so far? What do you do with the bear spray? Do you spray yourself or the bear? Well, I'd probably spray the bear, and if it keeps coming, I'll spray myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I figure if a bear attacks me, I'm just going to poop myself. <laughs> and then I'm hoping that the smell just thinks that I'm, that I'm dead, and it leaves me alone. Are we sure you're human at this point? I'm not human. No. <laughs> Are we sure? <laughs> has a bear ever during your trail has a bear tried to at least take your breed? no I said it, it may have came in to actually I think something did come in when I had it on a tree because it got through this and this got a tooth mark in there and then some of the rope came out but not the actual Kevlar. So if it came in during the night, it, this could have been a chipmunk or something too, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It could have, because the outside is not Kevlar, it's just the rope, and then the inside is uh, the Kevlar and everything else inside. But, so that could have been a chipmunk, for all I know. Not positive, but. Any other questions? I want to know about your, uh, that pocket rocket. Yes. Uh, do you have to clean them? I have not cleaned mine. And three through hikes, I've never had a problem with it. Well, I'm having trouble with it. Okay. And I have trouble with starting it, and sometimes I have trouble, I can start it, and then it'll go out. It won't stay lit. The jets could get clogged depending on what kind of fuel you use. I've always just, it, I don't know. I the, use those canisters. Yeah, the canisters. I've never had a problem. Okay. And now, a lot of the times these canisters, when it gets to freezing and below, it won't, it separates in here. So you have to keep this warm. So before you, you may want to keep it, when you start what to set your tent up. What if they're old? Like I've had it, I've used it, the little bit's taken out of it, and then I go another season and I try to use it again. This should but be no problem. Means, it shouldn't have a problem. Okay. You should not have a problem with the fuel that's in there. It's compressed. Okay. So there shouldn't be a problem with that. It could have been a dirty batch. You got a one canister and has some, maybe some dirt got in. Okay. On the, the one jet, and you'd probably have to tear it apart to clean it. Clean it up. But okay. that's that's all I would say on that. Okay. okay. When it's hot out and you're in your sleeping bag, well, you don't have a bag, you have a quilt, so you're directly on your sleeping pad. Yes. It's pretty sticky, doesn't it? Not when, because I'm always wearing some kind of clothes. Even when it's hot? Even when it's hot. Because same thing, I don't want all my oils and dirt from my body to get on that because it still has the R value of that and I don't want it to interfere with radiating the heat back to me. So I always wear a top and bottom and I wear socks. The only thing I don't have is something to cover. And when it was cold, I would wear gloves to bed because my hands, I always slept on my side. So my hands like up by my face, they would stick out. So I always try to keep gloves on. And if, like I said, if it was cold, I kept my neck cap on. No, it, there were times where I was on hikes where people had zero degree bags. My quilt, this one is 32 degrees, and I was to switch to a 10 degree quilt, and I was warm. 
but there was one night on the Appalachian Trail where the people were hiking and they had zero degree bags and they were shivering in their bags. So we have, I've had temperatures where it has gone below zero. When I went over train for a hike up in Quahanna Wild Area, I would, I would cut my hiking off if the windshield or the, air, the regular temperature was zero degrees or below. That's where I would not hike. I would just wait a day or so. How much does your bag, your backpack weigh after you get everything in? Everything, with all my gear, my backpack, pant, sleep, every, all my clothes is 18.5 pounds, which is considered pretty lightweight. When then with the food, two pounds per day, the water, when I was in the desert, the most I carried was five liters. Each liter of water is 2.2 pounds, so that was an additional 11 pounds going from water. But we would have up to 28 miles from water source to water source. So you would camp around a water source, so you would carry that five, and that the most I had was enough to carry five liters, and that would have to get me to the next water source in the desert. But it was usually between 18 and 22 was our like our average. And, but 28 was our longest day that we had to go from water source to water. And my longest day hiking was 46.4 miles. And that was going through the Great Basin to come out uh, into Wyoming. But that was when I was on the main route. There's nobody out there. Entire lakes were dried up. So my last water sources, I was not planning to do the 46.4 mile that day. But when an entire lake is dried up and there's no water and I'm out of water for the last couple hours, I had to keep hiking until I got to the campsite when I was 8 miles, 8.8 .8 miles away from Rollins, Wyoming. And thank goodness I got to the campsite, there was one person left. He had an RV and I knocked on his door and I said, sir, can I buy something cold to drink off of you? And he says, you threw like a fist, sir. And I mean, I'm to the point, I'm bent over, I'm like, I can't even stand up, I'm, I was that bad and he brought out three bottles of water and I chugged one right after the other, all three of them and he said give me one of those and I gave it back to him he filled it up with iced tea I chugged that so there's a half gallon of water just an like instant and he said here's two more but save these for the morning those four will do you for now like, thank you sir he said, he said I can thaw out some food if you want something to eat I'm like no I have food I'm just dehydrated bad thank you and I thanked him profusely I said, you probably saved my life because I was, like I said, I was in bad shape. And the next morning, I got up, drank those two, did the 8.8 .8 miles to Rollins, no more water along the way. My hotel room wasn't ready, so I went to McDonald's and I drank five big of the glasses of iced tea and Coke and a milkshake, and I ate breakfast and then <laughs> lunch. And it was still was until that evening before I finally peed. That's, that's how bad I was. I was in bad shape. I was in real bad shape. And when the guy at the, the RV said, why did you bring, take this route? I said, this is the red route, this is the main route. He says, yeah, but all the hikers are getting off and they're road walking, cutting off 22 miles of the trail. He said, everybody else is doing that. I'm like, well, I didn't know. <laughs> so, because you know, I didn't know that all those lakes were dried up, so. Mm -hmm. But some hikers did that, but not very many. Uh, were you mostly on the eastern side or western side of the continental divide? Well, we it would go back and forth depending on where you were because like I said, sometimes you couldn't stay straight on it because once you're up on uh, above tree level, you just can't, especially when the thunderstorms come in, you have to bail, you have to get off. And like I said, that one day when I got, I was trying to get to the pass and I was above tree and it was, like I said, it held on me 10 times that day and that last one, drove me down and I had to drop 1,500 feet in elevation to get under trees where I could set my tent up. And I found a water source that night. And then the next day I spent bushwhacking through the woods trying to get to the trail. I mean, I could see it on my thing and it's way up there. And I'm like, I'm not climbing 1,500 feet back up, straight up. So I said, the trail's going this way. So I beelined it through, but I was climbing over, you know, downfall trees and going through it, it, it was it was it was hard and I sprained my ankle towards the end right before I came out to the pass where I came back to the CDT and that was when I was back in Colorado so and the highest point on the trail is Grace Peak in Colorado which is 14,000 like two or 200 some feet I think and then 
I did Mount Torres, which is right beside it, you know, about a thousand foot drop and then a thousand foot back up another 14,000 foot peak, which is not part of the AT or the CDT. I was just on that uh, day pack who I started the hike with, doing it day pack and happy. And then day pack had to leave the trail because he had shin splints so bad that he left the trail, but he actually had fractures in his leg and he was off the trail and then he just moved forward, did that. Finish at uh, Canada the week before, prior to me, and then he went back to Colorado, and then he came and hiked that last day with me to go up Grace Peak. So that was that was beautiful. He did that since because he had already hiked Grace Peak, so he was able to show me and what to do. That was pretty neat. The uh, the peak we hiked with, you must kind of become friends with people who are. Yes, because you want to do what's called hike your own hike. And you don't want to say, if I'm doing, I want to do 30 miles a day, and I say you want to do like 20, we're not going to match. So you want to find people who are going your same pace, want to do the same miles, that don't want to spend your time in town, because you can spend your time in town and spend a lot of money on going to the bars, and it's called, you know, you can, you can get trapped in towns because you have the luxury of hotel rooms or hostels where you can stay and you're like, yeah, I don't want to go back out in that weather. And you can actually get in this vortex where people end their hikes because they stay in town so long that they spend all their money and then they're, they have to leave the trail. So you know, I always try to hike with people that did comparable miles to me every day. How much would you say um, it costs? The Continental Divide Trail is very expensive. Like when we got to, for example, Steamboat Springs, when we came into that town, the cheapest hotel, and it was a total dump, I mean a total dump. I should have just slept outside somewhere. But it was $150 a night. Some of the rooms are going for $300 a night. Mm -hmm. But it's all tourist areas going up through Colorado and going through, mm -hmm. and it's so expensive. But the Appalachian Trail is pretty cheap because you can stay at hostels and do work for stays, but you don't have a lot of those options on Continental Divide. It's not as well known. So it doesn't have the big support yet as the Appalachian Trail does. So you're talking like a rough estimate? I spent a lot because I having to fly home okay. when I couldn't get my shoes. So that, yeah. that took a lot, but it was a lot. Usually the Appalachian Trail, they say two to two and a half dollars per mile okay. to plan. So four to five thousand dollars probably a little more now, this is a couple years ago, but the CDT, a lot more, a lot more, yeah. And no, I have no plans to do the CDT again. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've done it, you can say you've done it, you're never doing it again. When you would go to towns to like resupply, what was the hardest thing that would like, you would find that you needed to resupply and you couldn't get east in that area? A lot of the towns you get to, being tourists, everything's super expensive. And some of the places you would only find a little convenience store. So it was very, they had stuff for campers, like the ramen noodles, stuff like that. So you would have to just buy things that you normally don't buy. And sometimes that would add up to a lot of extra weight in your pack, but you had to have the food. Mm -hmm. So you just had to deal with it. But just so, it was too expensive. Did things being shut down and shipping being messed up and um, supply stocks being down on some products affect you getting supplies for the trail? No. Like I said, there was always stuff on the shelves out there, but you just had to pay an arm and a leg. And then my brother, Mike, and his wife, Karen, they did a great job. I had stuff that was uh, prepackaged, and I would you know, send them a message, hey, I'm going to stop here next, can you send my next package? And I had packages with all pre-bought food that would go from anywhere from five to eight days. And I would say, okay, send me a five-day box to this address. And then he would send me my box and I would get it. And then I would, knowing that, because there were places that there was, when you got to a town, there were no grocery stores. There was no place to, and all they had was a post office. So you had to have a package delivered to you. And those are the places I had, like, eight packages of five and two packages of eight days pre-planned. So I guess. Send it to the post office. 
post office or like a business. Yeah, I, I got to the point where I didn't do the post office because their hours can change. Mm -hmm. And if you get there on, let's say they close Saturday at noon and you get there at 1 p.m., mm -hmm. you, you can't get your package till Monday morning. So I would find a place that had like a hotel, different hotels that cater to the hikers. And you can set it to a hotel, you can set it to like an outfitter, stuff like that where, and I got that out of the book that I was reading. They would have the places in their addresses. Okay. So I would send them to those places. Knowing that, hey, I may show up on a, a Saturday or Sunday and I didn't want to have to wait an extra day or two to get my, my stuff. Mm -hmm. so. And they would hold stuff for you? Two weeks, usually two weeks. Post office will hold it two weeks. Different businesses, it depends, because you got to put your, your full name, not, not your trail name, but your full name and your estimated time of arrival. And most, most of those places would hold for two weeks also. Some, they got pretty ignorant of different things. They, they didn't want, some were getting stuff and hikers who came before were pretty nasty, how they treat people. So these people would just, they just start sending packages back. They're like, we're not dealing with hiker boxes anymore. And that, that was horrible because the people relied on that. Yeah. Just because you have a couple bad eggs come up before you and treat the town people bad and they catch an attitude and so like, you know, you, all you through hikers are horrible people. We're not dealing with your stuff anymore. So that, that got hard. But I never had anything set back. So. How long did it take? Four months and three weeks. No, four months and just over two weeks. But I was home for a week and a half. So just a little over four, four months in total. As opposed to the AT, my first time I did the AT was five months and three weeks. The second time was four months and three weeks. I took a, a month off of that. Of course, I got hurt the first time uh, on the Appalachian Trail when I fell off that boulder. I hurt my leg and my shoulder. So I was off the trail for a little bit. Then, yeah, so. But this one, yeah, we were doing some pretty high miles. How was it? How risky was it? Sometimes very risky. When I did that last section in Colorado to get to to get to Grays Peak, I took that one alternate route, which I shouldn't have, to meet up with my friends Dan and Nancy. And I, I mean, I got to it and I saw where the trail, I mean, there was no trail. It was just nothing but sheer rock going up. I'm like, that can't be it. So I looked to the side, I said, well, I can go around this. And I started going around it and it got steep and some of the rocks were going out from underneath my feet. And I'm like running rock to rock as they're going out underneath me, scared to death that I'm gonna fall to my death. And then that's the day it hailed on me 10 times. And I'm just getting frustrated and I'm, I'm like, this is the bad decision, I shouldn't have taken this trail. And I'm doubting myself and I'm praying a lot for my safety. And, and that was another day I thought, this is, this is not gonna end well. But, it was just, yeah, there were some very risky days and the risky days in the snow I to worry about uh, doing self arrest, but I made it, so I'm happy. <laughs> Do they have like an entire department of guardian angels just dedicated to your hikes at this I, point? I think my guardian angel probably <laughs> wipes, wipes his brow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Wait, they might have a couple dedicated just to these hikes yeah. at this point. The amount of different people who have just met you and helped you out of nowhere, it's yeah. amazing. Are you sure that the guardian angels just didn't turn into humans just given that? Well, yes, 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 so he does that's why, yeah. <laughs> yes, but the amount of time, at this point, it's probably an entire department, not a single person. I know, I mean, not every night, but every night I would try when I got to my tent, I, would, I used to carry a little, uh, little Bible, a little travel one. And I would try to read a chapter every night and then go continue and mark it and then read the next chapter the next night. Some nights I couldn't because I would either forget or I'd start talking to the other hikers and we'd eat and then just kind of just pass out just from exhaustion where it was dark and I'm like, oh, I just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I would try every night to actually read from the Bible and say my prayers and pray the next morning before I would start on my hike asking for protection and guidance along the way. So is, so when technically, I don't Wait, it's gotta be 
at least five. No. Seven. <laughs> that would be the right amount. I don't know. One for each day of the week of each day of the week so they have rotating shifts. Okay. <laughs> um, I know the Continental Divide isn't as popular as the AP. Yeah. How crowded is it? You could talk about both. If you want to. The Appalachian Trail was very crowded in the beginning. You can, I, I had spots when I got to the Smoky Mountains and uh, the camping areas where there were 75 hikers and everything was taken up in the shelter and every tent site. And the one place I slept in the Smokies, I found it was like on the side of a hill and I slid across my tent and just because it was that much of an angle. It was just way, there's too many people. And on Connell Divide Trail, I mean, every trail was like double because the fall, the year prior, everything was shut down because of COVID. And I was actually supposed to do the Pacific Crest Trail last year, but they still weren't sure if they were going to issue the permit. So Donut and Bird Dog and I, we got together. We're like, well, we were going to do the, the Continental Divide two years after we did the Pacific Crest. So we said, let's flip flop. So then that's why we decided to do the Continental Divide this past year and then do the Pacific Crest in the future here. But, so you had double hikers in all three of the trails last year to make up for 2020. So it was more, more hikers on Continental Divide than normal. Because you, you can go days on Continental Divide and not see another hiker. But like I said, on this one, we saw hikers pretty much every day. How many scratches did you get on your legs each day? Scratches, uh, numerous to count. Because there's so many blowdowns from the storms it's like taking a box of toothpicks and dumping them out and consider those miniature trees and just do them to scale and you're just climbing over, under, through, underneath. And it was horrible. And then that was one of the reasons why I skipped that one section in Colorado, that 95 miles to move up when I had to, when I, I couldn't get a great peak because of the storm. It was stocked in. And the storm hadn't moved from the day prior and you couldn't see five feet in front of you in the middle of the day. You could not see the trail. And you're going across the knife edge and all that. So we all bailed except for Storm Dasher. He's the only one that moved forward. He went through that. Storm Dasher, no wonder. Not Storm Dasher, my buddy. And so we all bailed and went down to Georgetown and I called my friend Megan, who's from Clearfield. She lives out there and she came and picked me up, took me to her house. And then she took me back. I said, I'm not, I can't do it. So I'll, I'll do Grace Peak when I finish the trail. So she took me to the north side to the parking lot, dropped me off in a hike. And that day I didn't get five hours or five miles into the trail and I was being sleeted on, hail, rain, snow. So I put my tent up, got in it. I was in my tent for 18 hours while the storm went through. Got up the next morning, I got above, going above tree level, everything's a sheet of ice. I couldn't go. So I. I came back where I had cell service and I called her. I said, Megan, I hate to ask, but can you come get me? I said, I can't, I can't hike in this. And she drove back from Aurora an hour and a half, picked me up, took me back to her house again. And she says, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, well, I got to move forward, I guess. Uh, so we planned and we're looking at the weather. This is in July and it's like, we're getting, and the, the forecast is showing more snow each night for the next couple of nights. And I said, I, I just can't deal with the snow anymore. So we moved, she took me forward where the elevation dropped below 10,000 feet. And I started from there right at the south end of the Rocky Mountain National Park. And that 26 mile loop was closed from a fire from the previous year, so we had to cut that off. So, but then we got up further up and then we didn't deal with as much snow. So, thank goodness. But it was just, it was a tough through hunt. It was tough. Yes, that was the one I came back and did that 95 miles southbound then yeah. from that, from the hospital all the way back to Grace Peak. Did you carry like external power to like anything like extra battery? Yeah, I had like this uh, battery bank and it was able to charge my phone two to three times when I was out there for the five to eight days. And when I was out there, I just kept my plane on airplane, uh, airplane mode so it wouldn't suck the battery down. And I would just take pictures and do my videos. And if I had cell coverage, where I was camping that night, I would try to post on Facebook, you know, this is the day I did this many miles, this is where I'm camping, blah, blah, blah. 
and I'd post that. And as soon as I would post it, I would go back to airplane mode. And I wouldn't answer anybody's texts or messages until I got to the town, and then I would try to catch up when I got to the town. None. Too many. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I went through five pairs of shoes, too. So, five. And how the youth group leader was twitchy the entire hike. Because those, like, five to eight day stretches, we just wouldn't hear from him. Yeah, there's no... And then he just suddenly, a Facebook post would show up, and he wouldn't yeah. contact anyone other than a Facebook post. Yeah. So, yeah, was... <laughs> Facebook was the only way. Like, we knew he wasn't just... Stranded somewhere in the middle of the woods. But my family always knew because my little uh, inreach, the message went out. Some nights it wouldn't even go out. There was, there was, we're deep in these valleys where we would camp, and the signal wouldn't even go out to where it would send. It wouldn't send till the next day. So sometimes the family didn't even get our messages because they didn't even go out. We were that, that deep in where the mountain ranges were blocking the, the thing to the, the satellites. What were your three preset messages? Basically, it was just that um, I'm out of cell coverage. We've stopped for the night. We're okay. Basically, that's what it was. We are, I, I use one. I'll click every on it when we go. But I think mine was like, we're all okay stopping. And then I have that as um, an all okay starting. So like in the morning when we get up or at night, if we were done. And I also have like a slash for like, yes, after one and no after one. That way like somebody had to get a hold of me okay. and ask me questions. Like I told my, my husband, he's like, if you have to text me, text me a yes or no question. And then I can respond back to that using one of those other okay. messages and it's free. But then my other one was like, um, we're all okay, but delayed. That way they knew that like we weren't where we were expected to be, but we were still on and moving along. Nothing. Anything on top of that, you probably just pay money and text somebody and like. It was, it was if nice. More serious than that, then I'll pay the dollar text messages. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like exactly. <laughs> to to find me. And on the, these things, it has SOS. Yes. Or you can yeah. just pull this out, hit the button, and then they'll contact you, the, the search and rescue, and they'll say, you know, what's the emergency? And of course, then you guys sit there and try to type it. If you're not responding. They're going to put a bird in the air to come yeah. for you. So you just push it. If you, you're incapable, you just pull that off, hit that button, and you just wait for rescue. But you know, with the messages, like I said, I would start my tracking that day, and I would turn that tracking off at night, then send my message. So my family and Donut's family could sit there and look at our messages where we started to stop, and they're able to zoom in and see the train that we just walked through yeah. and where we saw. They can pinpoint exactly where we are. So that was really neat that the family gave the family peace of mind that, hey, this is where I was that last would, known. That would also be good in case of an emergency because if they're search and rescue, they can say, you were la your last like known coordinates were this, start at this point. Because if you were seriously injured, you wouldn't be moving far. Yeah. And when I hit that search and rescue, they have the coordinates right, right. where my right. where that thing is. So they'll be able to come right to where I am. We're, I think plan. Donut got the middle plan. Okay. So we were able to get a few more text messages in yeah. there. But yeah. he, he did it all, and then when he had to get off trail, because his granddaughter, uh, his grandkid was born, yeah. so he had to leave the trail, <laughs> and he gave that to me. And he's like, I want you to have this the rest of the way. And so then I would use it. So he would still get, his family would get all my messages, yeah. but my family got it too, so. And he, they, <laughs> he had to show me how to use it, because me and technology do not get along. <laughs> Nick can tell you, I am not good with technology. You have to have someone else turn on the DVD player. Yep, I can't do anything. Please don't look at a computer. Yep. If I touch something, look out, it just it goes bonkers. I'm not good with that stuff. Any questions before we start the slideshow? Okay. Real quick announcement. For anyone watching online, we'll post the pictures tomorrow. Okay. Um, because they can't see them on the screen. So the pictures will be up tomorrow, and the online part's going to be over right now.